we're now going to look at an alternative definition of the derivative. And, I mean, it gives you the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it. And we kind of looked at this um, when we talked about the average rate of change. That, uh, in fact, I started out with this one. And then I brought in the x plus h to give the difference quotient that we've been using. And so this is using the original difference quotient. And so here's a picture here. Um, let f of x be a function, okay? And so um, here's x on the function. And then here's some other point, we're gonna call it z on the function. So this is x, f of x, z, f of z. And so what we can do is we can define this difference quotient here, where it's a difference in the, the y values, difference in the x values, and it's gonna be the limit as z approaches x. So instead of as h approaches zero, it'll be as z approaches x. So we could say f prime of x is equal to the limit as um, z approaches x of um, f of z minus f of x. So difference, that's difference in the y values, difference in the x values, z minus x. Okay, and so it's just a different way of looking at it. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. Uh, there are situations, certain functions, where it can be useful to use this definition to show that it doesn't have a derivative. Um, so let's just look at a few examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the square root of x and 1 over x using this definition. So I actually use the x plus h definition when we talked about the average rate of change, and you may want to go back and look at that. This is using this definition now, and you can see how that works. So um, if I want to do f prime of x, this is going to be the limit as z approaches x of the square root of z minus the square root of x and z minus x would look like that. Now, this will be kind of weird, but I'm going to factor this here as follows. So this will be the limit as z approaches x. So on the top, I get square root of z minus the square root of x. But now I'm going to factor this as the sum and difference of things that look like this. So it would be the square root of z plus the square root of x. Um, square root of z minus the square root of x. So the, the idea here is this is the difference. If this is a and that's b, then this is a squared minus b squared. Because when you square these, you just get z and x, right? And then what you see here is that one of these cancels out, right? Like that. And you're just left with the limit as z approaches x of... 1 over square root of z plus square root of x. Now I can take the limit as z approaches x, and as long as um, uh, x here does not equal 0, so that z is approaching 0 and that's 0, okay, given any other number here, um, then this this will actually the z would be the square root of z would become the square root of x plus square root of x. Okay, and so then that could be rewritten as one over two over the square root of x. And if you look in the earlier videos when we did this the other way, we got the same thing. So this would be the derivative formula. Then I could plug in an x value into here. Um, as long as it would have to be uh, this here. It, I mean, we're dealing with just uh, values on 0 to infinity, right? Domain values. And this, uh, this actually wouldn't be defined at 0. So the function square root of x is actually not... Uh, differentiable at zero at the beginning of the domain, but then it is after that, okay, for any other value here. Um, 
So this is uh, an example of square root of x. Well, what about this one? Let's try this. Uh, I could do um, f prime of x is equal to the limit as z goes to x. And then I'll have uh, 1 over z minus 1 over x all over z minus x. So it would look like that. Now what I'm going to do, this will be the limit as z goes to x. And then I'm going to combine these over a common denominator. So this would be x minus z over z times x all over z. Um, and by the way, this should be an x here. So that should have been an x. z minus x. Okay. And it would look like that. And then I could write this like that, right? And then I could rewrite this as the limit as z approaches x. And then this here, I'm going to take the numerator and I'm going to commute those around by putting a negative outside. So it would look like this. Okay. And that's the top here. But then I'm going to invert and multiply the bottom here. So this is 1 over z minus x. And now you can see why I commuted that around. So I can cancel this factor out. But you still have the negative 1. So this is the limit as z goes to x of negative 1 over z times x. And now I can let z go to x as long as x isn't 0 which it can't be because this isn't defined there. And if I do that, then I would be left with like 1 over x times x. And that's just, uh, I, I'm sorry, negative 1 over x times x. And that's just negative 1 over x squared. And again, if you look at the other definition, we arrive at the same thing doing it this way. It's just a slightly different way. I would say the other definition maybe is more natural for both of these because this, this factoring here is a little strange. You wouldn't necessarily think of that. Um, but once you've seen things done like that or moving, shifting that around like that is a little strange. Um, once you've seen it done, though, you can always give it a try, right? You just have to see it done. So now what I want to do here is let me show you how this can be defined at a point as well. So let f of x be a function, and now we're going to find the derivative at the point x equals a. Okay. So in other words, instead of an x here, we have a, so that's an actual constant, a point. And this is z somewhere other than a, right? And so we have z, f of z, a, f of a, and we take the difference in the f values, the difference in I'm sorry, the difference in the f of x values, or the y values, the difference in the z values, and then we'll get the derivative at a is the limit as z goes to a, oh, yeah, z goes to a of f of z minus f of a all over z minus a. So it would look like that. So let me try this one. So g of t is equal to t squared. So now I'm sw switching up the notation a little bit here, right? g of t is equal to t squared. And I want to find the derivative at t equals 3. So I want to find the derivative of g prime of 3. Okay? And so this is going to be the limit. And so my 3 is the a here. So the limit as z approaches 3. And then I'm going to do f of z, so this will be g of z, which is just z squared, minus, and then I just have 3 squared, right? Uh, and then z minus 3. Okay, well that's like 9, this is like z squared minus 9, and so I can factor that into, into, um, uh, sum and difference of a binomial. So I have z plus 3, z minus 3, all over z minus 3. 
and then we can see that this cancels out and then I'm just left with the limit as z goes to 3 of z plus 3 and um, when you plug 3 into here you just get 6 and so again this is at a point I don't get a function here I get an actual value and that is the slope of the line at 3 so in other words you have your parabola right y equals x squared and then you know 1 2 3 and then at this point the slope of that line is 6 at 3 okay um, if my y is equal to x squared dy dx you could actually do this in general you would just get 2x right and so my dy dx at x equals 3 is 2 times 3 so this is what you would get if you did it for any x and you got the derivative function and then you plug in 3 you get 6 so this is doing it and getting 6 at the end because you're doing it at that point okay so that's kind of the idea of doing the derivative at that point. Again, I do like this. I like getting the function and then being able to plug in any value for my x. Okay, But there are times where it is important to be able to do the derivative at a point. And one uh, reason for wanting to do the derivative at a point is to show that a function is not differentiable at that point. And it's not going to be differentiable if the limit does not exist. If the limit does not exist, it is not differentiable. And so I haven't talked much about this, but we are going to talk a little more about the graphs of functions. But um, for a function to be differentiable, and we'll, we'll talk more about these in, in some other videos, but the idea is when a function is differentiable, it's a nice smooth graph it's like this flowing curve right and if you look at the tangent lines from point to point on the curve they just fade one tangent line just fades into the other right so you got these tangent lines like this like this like this and then across and then down and every point on there would have just these smooth t tangent lines and so it doesn't make any the tangent lines don't make any sudden jumps as it goes from point to point okay so a function that's not differentiable let me give you an example of a function that's not differentiable so let's say you have a, a function that goes like um, up and then it goes like that okay so at this point here um, we'll say at C so F prime of C um, does not exist okay it means it's not differentiable so you see you got these smooth curves but at this point right there's no tangent curve you got a whole bunch of possibilities, right? Uh, another way to think about it is at this point, you have this kind of right before there, you got this big positive tangent line, and then right after, you got this negative tangent line, right? So you got these steep positive ones, and then these not so steep negative ones. And at that point, it actually makes a change from like a positive tangent line to a negative tangent line. It makes that jump. So anytime you get like a, a cusp in a graph like that, it's not differentiable there, okay? So polynomials are differentiable everywhere because they're nice, smooth curves. But anything that has something like this, then you got a problem, okay? And in fact, what we're going to find is um, if a function is uh, differentiable, it will be continuous. And so if it's not continuous, then it's not differentiable. Now, the thing about this one is it is continuous. So just even though it's continuous doesn't make it differentiable. But, um, but if it's not continuous, it will not be 
differentiable. Okay? I probably shared more than I needed to share there, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but what I want to do is I want to show, I want to do an example, and I want to show that, um, let's say, f of x equal to the um, absolute value of x um, is not differentiable at x equals 0. Okay, so um, we want to show that this is not differentiable at x equals 0. So what does the absolute value of x look like? Well, it's like a V. It comes down to zero, and then it goes like this. Y equals absolute value of X. Okay? And at this point, at this point, at zero, it's not differentiable. You see from here, like the slopes here are negative one, and then at zero, they automatically just jump to being positive one. So you have a sharp point or a cusp in the grab. It just suddenly switches direction as opposed to like a parabola that comes down in a smooth curve it just gradually goes to being flat and then gradually goes um, and becomes positive okay from negative gradually to zero to positive and it's taken all the possible slopes you know from negative through zero to positive the absolute value does not do that, okay? So this is one reason for showing, for showing this, because to show this is not differentiable at zero, I'm going to use this definition of the derivative, okay? So I'm going to go uh, f prime of zero is the limit as z goes to zero, of the absolute value of z minus the absolute value of zero. So this is this is like your a, z approaches a, the function at z minus the function at a, and then z minus a. This would be z minus zero. Okay? And this is going to equal the limit as z goes to zero. And these are just gonna go away. And you're just gonna get the absolute value of zero I'm sorry, the absolute value of z over z. So now notice, for any value of z, you're going to have the same number over itself, um, except for the possibility that when z is negative, it'll be positive here and negative on the bottom. So whenever z is negative, you're going to get negative 1. Whenever z is positive, you're going to get positive 1. And so the graph of this thing, in other words, this is like, 1, negative 1. It's not defined at 0. You're going to have a 0 here, and then a 0 here. And you see at 0, it's approaching two different values. It's approaching negative 1 from this side. It's approaching positive 1 from that side. So this limit does not exist. And so since the limit does not exist, f of x is not differentiable at 0. And so what I've just done then is I've shown that this function, the absolute value of x, is not differentiable at zero. It's because when I take the, this is actually a, a, a graph of the derivative, and you can see for all these negative values, it is constant. It is negative one, and for all these positive values, it's positive one. But there at zero, it jumps from negative one to positive one. The limit does not exist. It approaches two different values. Therefore, the function is not differentiable at zero.